using Uber to make a living. That's the other side of the equation. Um, there's just a huge amount of uh, you know, responsibility there in terms of, okay, let's make sure that not just that the, that the on-demand economy that is about pushing a button and getting a ride, that's great, but there's the other side of that too. The on-demand economy can also be quite interesting on the labor side of the equation, which is for the first time that, that I can tell, you've got work that's flexible to life and not the other way around. And what I mean by that is on the driver's side, they can push a button and get a ride. Sorry, they can push a button and get to work when they feel like it. They can also push a button and stop work. Right? I mean, the old version of the labor, sort of how labor is, you know, used to work, let's say, it's still a real thing today, but but certainly different in Uber. But you clock in, clock out. Clock in at nine, clock out at five or six, something like this. What if you got to pick up your daughter from school at three? What happens? Well, I mean, you might be able to ask for permission once, twice, certainly not a lot of times, and at some point that's just not going to work. But imagine if you know, you're on your own terms. Imagine if you can just, if you want to stop working, you can't. You want to pick your daughter up from school, you just can't. And that's really powerful. And I think that the second part of this is, um, you know, the old, the old school version of the labor movement is one that's exclusive, uh, meaning it excludes that only some people get the benefit of working. Only some people get the benefit of being in a particular union, and it excludes others from, from, from participating in sort of the Uber style, the Uber sort of version of the labor movement is it's inclusive, is that anybody can work. And what that means is that, well, in many ways, we look at Uber as being a safety net for a city. It's like imagine if a manufacturing plant goes out of business or another business in town is not doing so well and leaves people off. This work is here for everybody. And so those are the, those are the really amazing parts. But at the same time, of course, well, you know, we have to make sure that these rides are safe. We have to make sure that there's a quality of service that customers are happy with. What happens in deactivation situations? What happens when, you know, if this is how somebody's making a living in some way. I mean, 60% of the drivers are, 60% of the drivers are making, are, are doing 10 hours or less a week. So for a lot of folks, it's sort of supplementing income. But um, you then have to have a communication channel. Like, these folks, they need to be heard. You need, you need to create mechanisms for them to be heard. You need to create mechanisms for, let's call it, uh, uh, workplace justice or something. There needs to be a just system in place. And that's what we did in New York with the Machinist Union, is we created a situation where Uber can continue to innovate and do the things we do, but also creating a mechanism for sort of justice for the driver's side of the equation. Um, and also getting that feedback so that we, we are listening and making sure that we are continually making the system better, not just for riders, but also for drivers. So let's talk about justice for a minute, because obviously, uh, I think everyone knows that criminal justice is a priority, criminal justice reform has been a, is a priority of President Obama, and we can't do it without the private sector. And I know that you have taken a hard look at what you can do to ensure that people who are being released from prison have a fair shot at getting their life on track. Could you talk a little bit about that? And in backstage, we were talking about the philosophy of disruptors who also have to be concerned about justice and social justice and the role that they play in society. Well, look, and, you know, for, for us, well, let, let me say this. Imagine, imagine if there were a country where if you were arrested, even if you were found to be innocent, but if you are arrested, a huge amount of the work that's available is not available to you. We're not even talking about convicted. And imagine a country where people might be getting arrested that shouldn't be getting arrested. So imagine if that country were the US, right? Is that we have systems in place where if you're arrested, you literally can't get work, even if you're found to be innocent. And it's, it's un that's certainly unjust. And so, you know, when you, when you see Uber in the news about, oh, we're opposing this kind of fingerprinting law or something like that, these are ways for, in, 
incumbent industries to keep Uber from growing by keeping people from being able to get to work. And these systems that are often put in place, and you don't get into these details, these systems that are put in place, um, like literally keep people who are innocent and never done anything out of the workforce. Um, and so sometimes incumbents try to protect their industry, but then they do things that are incredibly unjust. And so I, I find that when you are, you, when you're an entrepreneur and you're in a place where you're disrupting an industry in, in a way, in a large way, well, it's going to be controversial. You're going to get lots of headlines. Certainly, that's something I've learned over the years. Um, but then that means that your principles for how you act, how you bring change to the world, I call it just change. You have to have very strong principles for when you, for, for when you change, how you change, and when you step back and don't do something. Um, and so that's super important. And of course, we appreciate the efforts you guys have done on uh, on the criminal in, on the criminal justice system here in America. I think there's a lot of things about it that are unjust, uh, and certainly we're fighting side by side to, to help make sure that the right things happen at the end of the day. Yeah. Should I talk a bit about criminal justice and our efforts? I mean. I, I, please. All right, so, well it's important, and I think it's important for people to recognize that the public sector cannot solve this problem alone. So just a few facts, we spent $80 billion here in the United States on criminal justice. $80 billion a year. We uh, have about 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. Uh, that is unsustainable, there are 2.2 million people in prison right now. 600,000 are released each year. And so as we look at reforming our system, we have to figure out, does it, we have to be, be prepared to be honest and say, does the current system work? And what we know is, is that we have mandatory minimum sentences, for example, for nonviolent drug offenses, that just don't make any sense at all. We would much rather keep those people in the system, working productively, get them remediation treatment if they need it, get them drug treatment, whatever it is to get them back on track rather than put them through the incarceration system. Uh, so we're trying to work with Congress to reform the, the laws on, specifically on nonviolent drug offenders. We're trying to ensure that people who are incarcerated develop the skills that they need so that when they leave prison, they can hit the ground running and lead law-abiding law -abiding lives. But the most important factor is whether or not they can get a job. Are they qualified for a job? And are there employers who will hire them? And so we really are looking to the private sector to make a pledge to do, for example, banning the box, where you don't ask at the front end, have you been arrested or convicted? You wait and let the person make an impression on you, because you might find that there's someone out there who's very talented, but they made a mistake for which they've paid their debt to society, and now they want an opportunity to get back on track. And so we encourage uh, everyone in the private sector to recognize our individual and our collective responsibility to ensure that our streets will be safer, and part of how you do that is you give people an alternative to a life of crime. Yeah, I mean, look, if you can't get work when, when after you've sort of paid your dues, what do you think is going to happen? You have no choice. You have no choice. And so, you know, this is something like Eric Holder is no longer Attorney General, but something you know, we have, you know, we've been working with him a lot on this kind of stuff, and I know you guys are doing a lot of good work. So uh, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of things that this country has to do from a government perspective as well as private industry to <laughs> find ways to get people back to work and give that opportunity, and there's a, there's a liberty that comes with that. Uh, and there's a an injustice when you don't get that. That's exactly right. Do you have any questions for me? Oh, I mean, I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> wow. I figured you were about wow. right? Because okay. I could ask him questions all day, but I, before our time runs out, I thought I would at least open it up for you. That's interesting. I didn't come prepared with any questions, but I can come up with something. Uh, <laughs> the, um, you know, I think, look, as an, as an entrepreneur, like, in a, as an engineer, uh, you know, we, we often don't think about, we try to stay away from politics. Yes. Now, now Uber is... You have no that, choice. Yeah. Um, Welcome to my world. You know, <laughs> but so, so, so I feel like I've got that welcome, you know, and uh, it's been a very warm welcome. Um, 
but but maybe turn you know turn this around a little bit is you know you're here in Silicon Valley, uh, you get to meet with lots of entrepreneurs when you're here. What's that like going from D.C. to the Bay? Heaven. <laughs> Heaven. Uh, Earth. Democratic members of the House are so frustrated that they have taken to spending the night on the floor because they're trying to get Congress, they're trying desperately to get their colleagues on the other side of the aisle to just take the most sensible steps to keep guns out of the hands of people who are a threat to themselves or to others. agree with that, and yet the dysfunction, the toxicity in Washington, the fact that you have a special interest group called the NRA that has a stranglehold over certain members keeps things from happening. So when you ask me, do I want to come out here and meet people who are going to not just make a lot of money, but change the world, I'd rather be with you any day of the week. <laughs> Now what about, okay, so, and, and then backstage we were talking about, well, there is, there are so many bright-eyed entrepreneurs making things happen here. Yeah. Um, how do you bring that optimism, that can-do, and honestly, that let's get shit done yeah. mentality, <laughs> how do we bring that to Washington? Yeah, well, we're trying to do just that. by the people and for the people as, actually has to reflect what you consider important. And one of the steps that the president has taken is trying to recruit people from Silicon Valley to come into not just the White House but throughout our administration and make things happen. So for example, some of you may have heard we had a little problem with our website when we first launched it for the Affordable Care Act. Um, if you haven't heard about it, that would be a miracle. But out of that challenge, we really recruited top-notch folks from right here in Silicon Valley to come and not just fix that problem, but then we said, well, you know, we have some other problems that we'd like for you to fix too. So we're trying to bring the best and the brightest talent into government to make a difference. But I also say, and the President says, it's the most important office is that of citizen, and we want you all to get involved, and you have to participate. You can't just say, well, that's a dysfunctional group of people. You have to actually try to improve your government and share your best practices that you have found work and in the hopes that we will try to implement the same. And it's not identical, but there are many ways that we can actually learn from each other and be partners and be participants in trying to improve our nation and our economy and make the United States globally competitive. And that's what led the president to want to have this important uh, summit that we're having here today so we could have entrepreneurs, not just from the United States, but all around the world, come here to the Silicon Valley, the you know ground zero for innovation, and let's learn from one another. So we are so glad you showed up. We had a party and you all came. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, we are out of time, but Travis, I want to give you an opportunity. Any closing bits of advice? There's so many entrepreneurs who are out here who I know sharing with Travis, I met a group the other night who had been at an idea for seven years and finally they're on the brink and they, they have figured it out, they have cracked that nut and part of survival, not just in the private sector but in government as well, is you just have to be persistent and determined and keep your view on the long view and be flexible and learn in between, but you, you walk the walk and talk the talk any advice for some of our entrepreneurs who are wishing that in six years they are where you are? Well, look, um, I think a lot of people don't know, maybe don't know much about my background, but prior to Uber, I'd say there was at least as much, if not more, failure than there was success. And the situation of going through a five-year period or a seven-year period and not 
still not, it's still not working. Maybe running out of money many times, I've, I've been there, um, moving back home. Uh, you know, it's not the end of the world. Uh, if, you, if you've got a family, I'll take you in when, things are, when times are tough. <laughs> you know, I got pancakes every morning, it was good. Um, but I think the thing is, is that, that being an entrepreneur is never easy. Um, that's not what you sign up for when you become one. And the minute it gets easy, that means it's about to get really hard. And so, just keep, you know, it, it is about that persistence. It is about um, knowing that it's going to be hard every day, but um, if you believe in what you do, you stick with it, even when people think you're crazy. And I like to say there is, um, the, the role of the entrepreneur is basically to understand the difference between perception and reality. Perception is conventional wisdom. It's what everybody thinks is right or is the answer, let's call it that. And reality, sometimes it's the same, but often it's very different. And I like to say the distance between perception and reality is the innovator's playground. But if you are going to play in that playground and you're going to tell the world that they're wrong by doing something over here, it means you have to get used to everybody thinking you're kind of crazy. And you have to get used to everybody saying this is not possible, or this is not right, or this is it's just not going to work. Um, and you have to kind of stick to your guns, and if you, are, if you are correctly seeing the difference between perception and reality, it will eventually work. And so understand that um, you may get 100 no's a day for five years straight before you start getting those yeses. But um, if you believe, if you're passionate, and you stick with it, and you are empathetic to reality, and you listen, um, you will eventually find, uh, you will find that success. Um, and, uh, and, and that's been my experience as an entrepreneur through good times and tough times. So. I think that's good advice, not just for entrepreneurs, but for life. That's what we're